Okay, so the, the, I guess it's a cool thing and a bad thing. So first is that I'm part of this talk. Uh, I get to talk. So I want to mention a couple things. Number one is, uh, since I'm part of this talk, you, you should be questioning, well, why is he running the talk and then he's a part of the talk? Well, it turns out that we submitted a talk, Nima and I, my colleague, and uh, of course, you know, when it came to review it, I was like, well, I submitted it, so I gotta stay out of it. And then it turned out that um, Matt ranked it high, so when I saw that, I was like, well, you know, it's gonna be bad because I'm part of the extension. And he kept on insisting, and I was like, okay, fine. That's cool because maybe people wanna hear about serverless. So that's what we'll talk about. But the other thing I wanna mention is, um, I don't know about a lot of you, but it's always good and bad when you feel old. <laughs> it's bad, I guess, and good. Uh, so why am I mentioning this? Um, so first thing is, uh, Nima here, uh, I used to be at IBM Research, and he was a student doing his PhD and, and work with me. Uh, so that makes me feel old, so that's one. And then the second part is, of course, it used to be a time when when I work with somebody, I kind of led the project and I kind of like did everything. Well, I'm feeling very old because he pretty much did all the work. So <laughs> I'm taking some credit, but yeah. he really did the work. So let me try to introduce the talk and then we can commiserate later about being old. Um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about serverless. So why is this cool and kind of like, why did I participate in this? It's because part of my job is to try to find out what's cool but also, how can we improve the platform, right? I mean, the platform we love, Cloud Foundry, which we're spending a lot of time working on. And serverless was the obvious thing. So first thing is sort of what is serverless computing, right? That's the first question you should ask. Uh, a lot of people look at it as functional programming. Uh, sure, but there is like tons of functional programming languages that you can use. Uh, so why, why serverless, right? Well, so functional programming on the web. Right? That's another way people look at it. So you're invoking remote functions. Uh, but then somebody at Pivotal, uh, I'll mention his name, maybe not, uh, Dimitri, uh, told me, well, that's like CGI. And I'm like, no, it's not CGI. It's like CGI. It's like, you know, his Russian accent. It's CGI. And then try to convince us. I, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's different, but it certainly looks like CGI. But it's lightweight, stateless, and so on. Uh, Obvious question that come up when you say, okay, well, should I start using serverless or like what, what's the advantage, right? So clearly, why, why is it different from PaaS, right? Uh, like what's so different, what's so cool about it, right? So first thing that comes up, especially when I start talking to other people at IBM that have been pushing serverless for a couple of years, is that it's gonna save you money, right? Well, but then the question is, is it gonna save you guys money that are maybe potentially customers of ours or competitors of ours, like some of our colleagues here from Pivotal that um, are running Cloud Foundry like we are? So which part, what is it gonna do for you, right? So I think those are the kind of things. The other thing is, is there a way to sort of compare, you know, like what I'm doing now versus what I was doing later? And of course, the obvious question is, couldn't you just like CF push the app and then just you know, be done with it? Why do you have to create another uh, complexity or another abstraction? So what's, what's the advantage? So what we try to do, and I guess in this talk, is to try to help answer that question in the context of Cloud Foundry. And specifically, I wanna limit what it's not, and then Nima is gonna go into the details of what it is, including some data and results. So first thing is, we're not proposing CF serverless, right? So this is not a proposal. I understand the whole process of proposal, I run it. But we're not trying to do this here. We're trying to experiment. Uh, and we clearly cannot explore all possibilities of serverless in Cloud Foundry just because we don't have enough time. Nima works in Diego. I kind of move around, spend some time on Bosch and other places. So we, we have day jobs, basically. So we tried to do something that was sort of like 20% work. Uh, and also, even though we work for IBM, we're not trying to favor one or the other. As a matter of fact, last time we tried to give this talk, some people at IBM told, told us, no, you can't do it. I was like, what? No, we were open source. They're like, no, you can't talk about it. I'm like, okay, but I will. So we are here to talk about it anyway. And part of it is because we're not trying to say you should go adopt ours. We're trying to give you a way for you to make your own decisions. And uh, 
The other thing also is that because we look at it as a set of test suites, it's not a complete test suite. And the final thing I want to do, and I'll pass it to Anima, is um, to mention briefly what we try to do in terms of the experiments and then the different platform that we targeted. So uh, we are defining experiments, run the experiments, and share the results. So sort of rinse and repeat. And those are the platform that we targeted. So Azure now has functions. Uh, OpenWhisk is IBM solution for this. Uh, you know, there is IronIO that has an open source version of this. OpenWhisk is open source. Azure, of course, is not open source. And then, of course, many of you probably know about AWS Lambda, which is sort of one of those pioneering work around serverless that was released uh, a while back. So with that, let me switch it to Nima. I'm going to sit down. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions so I can come back. Thank you. All right. I think I have one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Max. So I think two disclaimers. I don't think he's much older than me. <laughs> and then the other thing is that I think he also contributed significantly to this uh, work. And so just um, got to credit him for that. Um, so yes, as Max mentioned, the main reason we actually did this experiment was to understand serverless platforms. Especially because when we started doing this work, it was fall 2016, and these serverless platforms kind of were emerging at that point. Uh, it's more mature now, but at that point, it was like very early stage for a lot of these platforms. So what we wanted to do was to kind of have a way to understand how these serverless platforms work. And you know, if you want to choose one serverless platform over the other, what are the factors that you need to consider? So in order to do that, the first step that we took was that we decided that, okay, maybe it's better for us to kind of simulate something um, that resembles the behavior of a serverless system, and then that gives us enough understanding to then go and define experiments that we can run on these serverless platforms and see how they behave. And because we were all from Cloud Foundry, we were like, okay, Cloud Foundry is a platform that runs applications, and serverless systems are essentially functions that you load into containers and run, so it's more or less the same, so why not build something on top of Cloud Foundry that we can experiment with and understand the system? And that's how CF Serverless emerged. So we worked with the, the man in the Bosch team, uh, Dimitri, and we basically started coding something that was uh, emulating the behavior of a serverless system. And the way it worked was that it was basically a CF application that you would push to a Cloud Foundry deployment, and that CF application would manage other applications in the platform. So if you have functions, you would define them in the form of typical CF, server, CF applications, and then you would make a call to this manager application that would then turn on or off your other CF application as the request would go in. And that's more or less the same thing. Basically, it would turn the application on, it would respond to the, to the request through the, the application that it launches, and then would keep the container for that application around for a certain amount of time, let's say 30 seconds, and then if there is no new request to that application, then it would shut down the container. The main reason CF serverless are interesting is for two, two reasons. First of all, it actually cuts uh, abstraction significantly. Like you, I think with, with, uh, with PaaS, we went one level above IaaS in the sense that we didn't have to care about infrastructure. With containers, we went one level above it. With um, applications, we didn't have to care about anything, um, like at the level of managing and you know, running the operations. And, CF, uh, and serverless is interesting because essentially all you need to care about is the function that you run. So it's very low, uh, very high at the level of abstraction and significantly saves on engineering efforts that you need to put in place in order to manage a serverless application. Also, it's presumably cheaper because you're going to be charged only for the amount of time that your function runs. So if your function um, runs only like occasionally, you're going to get charged a lot less than having an application up and running for the entire time and having to pay for all the resources that you're using for while you know, having your application sitting idle. So with all this information, we built CF serverless, and we realized that there are a couple of things that are very important. So we started defining metrics. The first thing that we realized is that it's important to understand what the throughput of the serverless applications are. It's important to understand how they behave when there are memory intensive functions or CPU intensive functions. And also it's important to understand how these serverless platforms manage containers because we realized that container management is a significant part of you know, operating a serverless system. Um, so we defined a set of functions that would allow us to address these requirements. We defined an echo function, which, would, which was just basically a hello world function, and then um, you would launch it, and then it would send the hello world back, and then we would measure the time that it takes for the round trip. 
we had a memory intensive matrix uh, multiplication function which would multiply like two, 300 by 300 uh, matrices, uh, matrices um, and then return the results. And that's like a typical memory intensive problem. For CPU intensive functions, we had um, a function that would find the prime numbers below 1000. And again, that's a known problem. And also we had the curler function that would um, launch curling uh, of an endpoint from within a container so that we could understand whether a container stays around or whether a container gets killed after we basically send a request to it. So if a curler function, um, you know, to stop curling the endpoint that we were expecting it to care, they will notice that the container was killed. So full disclosure, the data that I'm gonna talk about um, is based on the results that we uh, collected during fall 2016 when we ran these experiments. So it might be that, you know, results have changed since. But for the experiments, we actually set it up so that all the functions that we deploy to all the platform and that include the AWS Lambda, the uh, Azure Web Functions, uh, IRO and IO, our own serverless instance, and OpenVisc, IBM's OpenVisc. And they, we all gave them 512 megabytes of data. We set all of them up in US East, except for OpenVisc, which I think is primarily available in Dallas. Uh, we uh, launched 100 uh, ramp up requests to all these uh, endpoints uh, to warm up uh, the platform, and then ran another 100 requests to collect data. And we did this in three rounds of execution. Um, and yes, the environments I mentioned. So let's have a look at some of the results. Um, we intentionally do not put these results side by side because we don't want to draw any comparative conclusions. If you want to draw any comparative conclusions, go do it yourself. But the purpose here is to just give you some ideas about how the platforms behave. So the type of workload that we actually launched towards these endpoints were in two modes, sequential or parallel. And that's how we actually decided about the throughput. The idea with sequential workload was that you would hit the endpoint um, once and then wait for a certain amount of time and then would hit it again. And then would collect the information about how much time it takes for that, uh, for that request to come back with a result. So if you can see, these are the results for CF serverless. And essentially the first request uh, that you sent to CF serverless um, the managing application that we wrote on top of CF uh, serverless would go create a con container, load the code for the function into that container, create the endpoint, and then respond to the request. That's why if you look at the graph, the first request usually takes around like seven seconds. But once the container is up and running, the next follow-up requests are gonna take a lot less because you know, the application is ready and it can quickly respond. If you delay, for more than 30 seconds, in case of CF serverless, we would kill the container. So your next request would take another set of time for everything to be up and running. Also, if you increase the load, potentially, uh, that in such a way that you need another instance of the application to respond to, re to your request, you would see a spike, which would involve creating a second container to respond to the application. So here is an example of a high throughput function where we actually did the same echo and this time by sending all the requests at the same time. And one thing that is very interesting, and these are the results from uh, Microsoft Azure, one thing that we noticed is that as we started sending more requests to the endpoint, the response time actually got slower and slower. So essentially, the request would get queued up and it would take longer for the request to, um, to basically come back with the result. But there was suddenly a significant drop in response time, and that's, why, that's when the, the serverless platform, in this case Azure, would realize that, hey, you know, I'm probably hitting the thresholds and it's better to launch another container to respond to this. And that second container, once, it, once it's in effect, all of a sudden it kind of drops the workload. But then it again it starts ramping up as, you know, more requests get queued up. So another thing that we looked at was the uh, container management. Um, one thing that is very important and one thing that we realized with CF Serverless was that you know, creating the container is probably uh, the most expensive part of the whole, CF, uh, the whole serverless uh, ecosystem because that's the part where you actually need to put these bits and pieces together and have an application up and running. So we wanted to see how other platforms behave when it comes to creating containers. One thing that we noticed was that for CF Serverless, um, we noticed that you know, if, um, you send a request, it creates a container, loads the code into the container. If your container is idle for a certain amount of time, we would kill it, and that's 30 seconds. For OpenVisc, 
for AWS, uh, Lambda, and for Azure, we realized that they actually keep the container around somehow because the request would take a lot less time to, to, to come back in the order of hundreds of milliseconds, which was very different from you know, the seven seconds um, that we would notice in case of CF serverless. Now, some of this is because um, in Cloud Foundry, we do some crazy magic when it comes to launching applications that involves you know, downloading the build pack, downloading the droplet, and all of that is quite expensive. But essentially, for some of these platforms, like Azure, we also noticed that when they start a container, even though it's like a plain, simple container, it can take you know, two to three seconds for the container to become available. We noticed that for Lambda, for example, that was a lot shorter, sometimes like in the order of 80 milliseconds. One of the assumptions we, we had was that maybe they are creating you know, some sort of a cache for the containers and keep one instance of the container around and you know, kind of freeze it so that it doesn't utilize that much resources, but then it becomes available very instantly once you need it. So one thing that is important is that we treated all of these platforms as black box because there is not that much information about how exactly they manage containers. So these are most, like some of this is based on our observations and the data that we collected, some of the assumptions that we have. So here I'm showing uh, the results of a memory intensive sequential function execution for 300 by 300 matrix multiplication. And you see this is the typical behavior that you expect from a serverless platform. So all the requests more or less come back at around the same time. It's kind of a flat line. And um, in this case it's a sequential one. So requests go one after another, but the amount of time that you see um, the function takes to execute is more or less the same. One thing that is um, interesting um, is that once you make something like um, resource intensive, like matrix multiplication um, parallel, then it can significantly degrade the performance of the system. This example is from Azure. The first few requests would actually take some time and then return back, but all of a sudden the platform would crash and everything would stop and we wouldn't receive any results. Then you know, another container would probably be launched and then it would respond to a few of the requests and then it would go down. So for something heavily memory intensive, uh, we noticed that Azure was not able to cope and scale well when there are a not good number of requests that go in. Uh, for CPU intensive, another resource intensive case where we actually did the experiments with, this is the result from CF serverless and we did it um, in a sequential fashion. You can see that again, the same pattern that we saw for Echo, the first request takes a lot longer because it involves creating the container. The follow-up requests are kind of flat. Um, in case of parallel, we did it with OpenWhisk. And we saw that OpenWhisk, um, and also Lambda, I believe, did a much better job compared to Azure when it came to handling parallel requests for resource-intensive uh, computation. So you see that there is a slight um, increase in the amount of response time that we noticed, but basically every single request came back successfully. And uh, the slope is not that steep, actually. The increase in response time wasn't significant, which was quite interesting. So it basically means that those platforms were able to better identify and understand that you know, there was heavier load on the platform, and they were able to better you know, create new containers and provide more resources as the number of requests increased. So some of the observations that we did in these experiments. Um, the first of, um, the, the, one of the interesting ones was timeouts. We noticed that um, you know, these platforms generally claim that, you know, that the timeout, the default timeout for a lot of the functions is 30 seconds, but you can change it up to five minutes. Um, the interesting thing is um, that these timeouts are only applicable if you launch requests to these functions from within um, the cloud environment that you operate. So if you're using Lambda, for example, you can increase the timeout to up to five, um, five minutes, um, but then you have to make calls to those functions from within the VPC. If you make calls to the functions from outside the VPC, from outside uh, AWS, the timeout is always 30 seconds. And it always kills your function if it takes longer than 30 seconds. So that's one of the things that you may need to and take into consideration if you want to use serverless functions from outside. Another thing that we noticed was that it's important to understand how your cloud platform scales if you launch a lot of parallel requests to it. Like for example, in case of Azure, when the computation was you know, resource intensive, we noticed that you know, the platform may simply give up. So it's important to understand how the platform responds. 
also, for that same matter, you need to plan for unforeseen load. Because if the load all of a sudden increases, and uh, your, your underlying um, system, or basically the serverless platform that you're utilizing, may actually perform in a weird way that you don't expect. Um, the other thing that we noticed was whether, like, there is this general assumption that more money always means better performance. But we noticed that it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily happen to be the case in case of serverless platforms. It very much depends on the architecture of the platform, the way they manage the functions, the way they manage the containers. So even though you may end up spending a lot, uh, a lot more money on a given serverless platform, if the platform doesn't do a good job managing containers, then it doesn't really matter. Uh, like you still are going to notice um, you know, disruptions in your service. Um, there is a blog post uh, that we have wrote highlighting some of these lessons that we've learned running these experiments. And I think the link is here. If you're interested, you can definitely go and check that out. Um, so the last thing that I want to mention before wrapping this talk up is where we want to go from here. Um, the main reason we, we did this was to understand uh, serverless platforms. So we started thinking about something like spec serverless, a bunch of tools and that we would make available open source so that you can go and run these against these different serverless platforms, collect similar data to, the one, uh, to what we've reported here, and then decide for your own whether a given serverless platform is the right choice for you. So uh, what we've done so far is that um, you know, we've put the proposal out there. Uh, we've defined the objectives, the metrics, the workloads, and also the tests. And we've drafted something that we are communicating internally within IBM and also Pivotal in order to decide you know, at one point we want to make it publicly available, both the tool and also the benchmark definitions that we've prepared and worked on. So I think that's it, and thank you very much. We have time for questions, like five minutes. So, all right, cool. Just mention your name and association. Hi, I'm Sabah from Pivotal. So is Diego task APIs not sufficient enough to run something like serverless functions? Because you can define a function, and Diego basically runs LRPs with some task. So there is a task API. Why can't we use that and basically have a pool oh, of, in Diego, in, pool in of your container instances so those can be immediately run with that specific task definition you pass, like a Python or Go or whatever, Ruby or Bash? You mean in Cloud Foundry, right? OK, so there are a couple of interesting things about tasks. The, one, uh, the first thing is that tasks are, do not get routes. So they do not become available externally. So you can have um, you know, an endpoint for your task so that you hit it. And every time you hit it, it actually does something for you. Tasks are kind of like background jobs, more or less. That's one of the main reasons you don't do it. The other thing is that tasks um, suffer from the same problems that I've mentioned here in case of CF serverless. Every single time you run a task, you need to create a container, you need to download the build pack, you need to download the droplet, and that's a very expensive thing to do. So oftentimes your task is going to end up taking seven seconds before it's actually ready to run your thing. Exactly. So that's one of the other things that we were thinking. That is, that is definitely something, but it's a lot more expensive work. Sure, sure. You could do that. You could do that. But so, we didn't do this part. So CF, like our implementation is basically a lot closer to a serverless behavior because it actually brings up the application and then it manages the life cycle of the application. So similar to tasks, but basically benefiting more from the fundamentals of Cloud Foundry in that sense. Matt? It, it seems like the, the largest time consuming process, as you mentioned, is starting up that that container and all the, the infrastructure efforts that need to go along with that. Did you consider the idea of simply having a, maybe a, a existing generic Python container that was always running and then loaded, uh, loaded that, those functions as modules on demand so that you weren't spending that container startup time every, every go? That's a, that's a very good question. Yes, yeah, so essentially, there are a couple of issues with having one container and then loading code, and that's one of the primary ones is security. Because containers provide a certain level of isolation, and you want your processes to be isolated from one another. You, want, you don't want one process to go and ruin the other process's um, data, for example, if it's running there, or ruin the state of that process for whatever reason. So you want the isolation that you get from containers when it comes to serverless. And that's one of the primary reasons you need to actually have separate containers for separate platforms. But yes, if you want to forget about all the security and all the good things that containers provide, that's potentially a solution. 
Any other questions? No? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it.